Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Cecil Baron Jensen, the Executive Director of the Artist Association of Nantucket. And on behalf of my colleagues at the Nantucket Arts Council and Remain Nantucket, it is my pleasure today to introduce Kate Levin. A little over six months ago, John, Melissa, Rachel, Virna, and I began thinking about the role of arts on Nantucket. Specifically, we wanted to find fresh ways for our arts and cultural organiz organizations to collaborate. Not only did we want to gain increased recognition for all that is being done on, in our museums, in our galleries, studios, theaters, but we hope to find ways for the island economy to further benefit from our efforts. It is our dream that when visitors are planning trips to Nantucket, that they are also booking their cultural agendas at the same time that they're making hotel accommodations and restaurant reservations. Nantucket is so much more than pristine beaches, fancy restaurants, and, and beautiful homes thanks to all of the hard work that all of you from the arts and cultural organizations do every day. As cultural assets management principal at Bloomberg Associates and the former commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, Kate Levin has ample experience fostering a cultural community. Her work includes consulting with cities around the world to improve the quality of life for their citizens through the arts. By introducing you to Kate and hearing her experience working with communities of all sizes, we trust that you will be inspired to seek out ways to expand the reach and significance of the arts here on Nantucket. Before you meet Kate, however, I want to start with a few important messages. After Kate's presentation, we will have time for question and answers, so please stick around and join us for a candid conversation. Special thanks to our friends at Remain for helping us to make Kate's visit possible and for providing us with the delicious snacks that you'll find in the back. Thanks also to our dear friends at the Nantucket Athenaeum for, for being our hosts today. If you would like to know about more future conversations about this kind of collaboration, there's a sign-up sheet in the back and we encourage you to put your name and, and email address there. And finally, if you haven't already done so, please turn off your cell phone. So with that, I hope you will join me in welcoming Kate Levin. Thank you so much, Cecil, Remain, and all of you for inviting me to be here. I guess it's still afternoon, right? It's not evening yet. It's so beautiful. I want to start by apologizing for the title of my talk. Uh, I am delighted or perhaps deluded to think that it was compelling enough to lure you all here, um, but there is a bait and switch. Rather than give you an affirmative account of the impact of culture, I'm actually here to describe what is still an emerging consensus about the value of the arts and the complexity of recognizing that value. Arts and culture can play a key role in the economy, identity, and quality of life of communities that embrace and encourage the sector, but the challenge is in appreciating why and how. Perhaps the biggest impediment is that culture doesn't count the way other industries do, and I mean that quite literally. The issue is perhaps most obvious from the perspective of government, and it's something I grappled with extensively during the past 12 years in which I had the honor of serving as part of Mayor Bloomberg's administration in New York City. The core deliverable of government is providing standardized and equitable services to citizens. I want my garbage to get picked up as frequently as you do, even though we may live in very different parts of town. But the value of culture is directly opposite to the degree that it can be standardized. If everybody painted like Fragonard, it would be a lesser world, albeit flowery and full of swings. But if we can't standardize, we still need to quantify to be able to speak compellingly about the impact of the arts in ways that don't rely on the charisma of the speaker or the anecdotal experience of the listener. 
because culture works on multiple levels simultaneously. Indeed, the arts are especially valuable precisely because of their range. They spark imagination and at the same time enhance and enliven neighborhoods, educate and uplift citizens while supporting a local economy. The problem is that it can be so difficult to properly reconcile and appreciate this range and simultaneity between, say, inspired personal transformation and enhanced tax base. So the premise of my remarks this evening, the impact of arts and culture on community, is as an opportunity to try and think together about translating, explaining, and defining the challenges as well as the opportunities around valuing arts and culture. Let me start by sharing another kind of perspective I gleaned from my government service, the perspective of history. During my recent period in New York, we were the largest single arts funder in the United States, and I gained a keen appreciation of the way in which the dynamics of creativity, economics, and civic prestige could be understood through the evolution of the city's cultural organizations. While the story I'm about to tell, briefly, I promise, is specific to a major US city, I believe it underscores a commonality found in all locations, that the motives behind the formation of cultural institutions clearly reflect significant community aspirations and they need to be taken into account. As such, these organizations have a special kind of capacity for fulfilling the potential of communities to express their most tolerant, empathetic, and imaginative collective identities. So let me start at the beginning, if I can get the clicky thing. Yes, it works. Um, I have very bad clicky thing mojo, so I'm grateful. Um, let me begin at the beginning. The oldest extant cultural institution in New York City is the New York Historical Society, and it was founded in 1804, basically out of concern that Boston was claiming too much credit for the American Revolution, <laughs> and New York needed its own archive. In essence, this institution was created as a civic middle finger to New England, and an assertion, in New England, sorry, it's true, um, and an assertion of New York's importance and aspirations. Later that same century, New York began importing culture in earnest as a way of affirming its growing economic preeminence. In 1869, as the Northeast recovered from the Civil War and the Gilded Age was starting up, a group of citizens came to local government with a deeply innovative idea. They would create a collection for public display if the city would build a building to house it. That compact gave birth to the American Museum of Natural History in 1869, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art followed a year later. This became the basis for a range of cultural institutions that form the bedrock of New York's cultural preeminence. The land and buildings belong to the city of New York. The programming and governance are the responsibility of private nonprofit corporations, and there are currently 33 cultural institutions owned by the city of New York along those lines. The mid-Victorian moment in which these first institutions were founded is really helpful in understanding the key impulses shaping them and shaping so many other cultural organizations around the country. In 1859, the City College of New York, cornerstone of what is now the city's greatest public university, was founded to, quote, educate the children of the whole people, close quote. The same democratizing principle comes ringing through the initial statement of purpose for the Metropolitan Museum. It was created to, quote, establish and maintain a museum and library of art, encouraging and developing the study of the fine arts and the application of the arts to manufacture and practical life, advancing the general knowledge of kindred subjects, and to that end, a furnishing popular instruction. These early documents specifically stipulate that teachers are to be admitted free of charge. So almost from the beginning, the city's involvement in the arts was predicated on an explicit relationship between culture and education. A different kind of relationship between arts and innovation was staked out by New Yorkers in the early 20th century with the founding of the Museum of Modern Art by three visionary women, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, Lily Bless, and Mary Sullivan. This was the first institution devoted to this subject matter, and as such, MoMA epitomized a brash city coming of age with leading citizens asserting aesthetic and economic authority by championing a radical form of creative expression. And talk about timing. MoMA opened 10 days after the stock market crash of 1929. Shoot. Closer? You want louder. Is that better? Okay, great, thank you. Another major moment 
in the city's relationship to culture was the groundbreaking for Lincoln Center, which happened in 1959 on the west side of Manhattan. At that point, the neighborhood was very much in need of revitalization, so much so that construction was actually delayed for two weeks so that the gang dance sequences in the film version of West Side Story could be filmed before the tenements that formed their backdrops were demolished. Today, the campus is home to 11 cultural organizations, including the Metropolitan Opera, the New York Philharmonic, and the New York City Ballet. The idea of a cultural campus has since been replicated around the world, but the major local significance of Lincoln Center was to assert the value of the arts as a tool for urban renewal. In 1974, the direct relationship of the arts and economics was asserted when the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey published the first ever assessment of the economic impact of the arts in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, which it pegged at $4 billion. That was a big number at the time, and it was also a big idea. What seems obvious to us now was major news. And the good part of that news was that this f study placed a quantifiable value on culture. As a result of that report, New York City spun out its own cultural affairs department, which had formerly been part of the parks department. You might say that the agency rose Aphrodite-like on the foam of economic analysis, but as I've tried to suggest, much of the buoyancy derived from a long linkage between many powerful civic forces. This slide shows you what New York's cultural ecology looks like today. The nonprofit sector is around 1,200 organizations strong, and the agency I ran funded about 900 of those organizations. Here are some of the number stories we use to advocate for government funding in New York City. Our nonprofit cultural sector employs 46,000 workers. It has an annual economic impact of $21 billion to the city's economy. And again, that's up from $4 billion in uh, 1974. And the $21 billion number is just New York City. Culture is the backbone of the tourism industry, which employs 370,000 workers. And then there are some individual data points. The Brooklyn Museum, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music are each in the top 1% of employers in that borough. The Bronx Zoo is the number one employer of youth in the Bronx. There are also some other ways of putting numbers on impact. One of my colleagues in Los Angeles a number of years ago studied the impact of the performing arts sector on the dry cleaning industry. In a census of New York City dance makers completed in New York several years ago, they found that patrons of the city's dance organizations spent nearly a million dollars a year on babysitters. These types of economic arguments are compelling for many audiences. But here's where the story gets complicated. Ultimately, dollars and cents don't begin to capture the most important impact of culture. Because art, of course, is different. At its best, it creates ineffable experiences. It's illogical. It's beautiful. It's transforming. How do you measure imagination? And how do you decide how much is enough? And just as the arts community often chafes at the limitations of economic impact as a standard valuation, so too others dismiss the dollars and cents and view culture solely as a matter of taste. That argument is far more reductive and misleading even than economic impact. For example, several years ago, a, number, uh, a local New York newspaper ran an editorial entitled Cops Versus Culture, following a celebration of the city's arts community hosted by Mayor Bloomberg. The editorial asked why the mayor was spending time and public funding on culture instead of on firefighters, cops, safe bridges, and sound schools. Now, I would never question the importance of public safety and our uniformed forces, but it's interesting to note that this perspective completely elides the significance of culture as a small business sector itself that provides robust ancillary benefits and can define a priceless form of local identity. I don't believe any local paper would ever run an editorial entitled Cops Versus Small Businesses. My experience in New York has been vastly expanded over the past five months at Bloomberg Associates. During this time, I've been able to work with colleagues around the world in helping to tackle specific problems related to the role of arts and culture in civil society. Working internationally has given me a better sense of how so many of our local issues resonate far more broadly. As I've tried to suggest, the formation of cultural organizations always reflects community aspiration, 
so too there are widely held misperceptions about the creative sector that can really stand in the way of properly valuing what culture has to offer communities. So I'd like to talk through the top five myths about culture and communities and the important truths these myths obscure. Here's myth number one, culture is big and elite. Remember what I said about the good news in the 1974 economic impact study that it set a baseline around the United States for putting an economic value on culture that people found impressive? Well, even if you don't remember what I said, especially if you don't. Here's the bad news. The bad news is that the single biggest problem with calculating the value of culture in terms of economic impact is that this approach almost always focuses on the largest institutions because they generate the most economic activity. And in an often painful paradox, those institutions become too easily caricatured as travertine marble palaces of high art in exclusive neighborhoods patronized by and accessible only to the wealthy. The reality, of course, is far different. In New York alone, we are blessed with some of the largest, most highly regarded cultural organizations on the planet, attracting international tourists and generating millions of dollars annually for the local economy. But these are the exceptions. Nearly half of the cultural organizations funded annually by the city of New York have annual operating budgets of less than $250,000. These organizations are also avatars of excellence, albeit on a different scale and with a different, more local and more nimble impact. A far more accurate view of culture is as an ecosystem in which organizations across a spectrum of budget size and artistic discipline are all essential to the vibrancy and impact of the whole sector. One way of understanding the essential role of smaller organizations is as points of entry for artists as well as audiences to develop interest and ability. And it can be helpful to see this value through the connection between nonprofit and for-profit organizations. That's a distinction that of course doesn't mean much to practitioners. No one comes to New York, for example, to be a nonprofit or for-profit artist. But from an advocacy perspective, the two ends of the spectrum are intertwined. So here's an example. New York City is currently home to roughly 380 nonprofit theater companies and 40 Broadway theaters. Two years ago, 16 out of 26 Tony Awards given to shows in those 40 Broadway theaters were actually for productions that originated in nonprofit theaters. Our stats weren't as good this past year because Matilda, which was developed in London and not as a nonprofit, but you know, you don't win every year. What the slide uh, behind me shows is the New York Theatre Workshop, a small theatre company in the East Village that seats around 199 people and is dedicated to supporting artists and developing new work. In recent years, several of its productions have transferred to Broadway as commercial ventures, including Rent, Peter and the Starcatcher, and Once, and the latter is still playing on Broadway, so I urge you to see it if you visit New York. These three productions have won a total of 17 Tony Awards, and the soundtrack of the film version of Rent introduced Adina Menzel's stupendous voice to a larger audience long before the Frozen phenomenon. Whether in the East Village or on 42nd Street, these productions have nurtured and employed actors, designers, directors, musicians, and crew members. In other words, this one small theater is an essential part of the arts ecology that produces the kind of work that ultimately gets broadly disseminated as part of commercial culture. And while commercial success should never be the benchmark for valuing smaller nonprofit organizations, it's essential to appreciate how interconnected and interdependent organizations of all sizes can be. Myth number two, the myth of the artist as lone genius. The image of the artist as a solitary figure toiling against the suffocating forces of conformity has loomed large in our culture at least since the time of the romantic poets and Vincent van Gogh. Among the dangers of this myth is that it can obscure the many ways that artists are workers standing shoulder to shoulder with their fellow citizens. This was made all too clear in 2009 during budget hearings for the National Endowment for the Arts when Georgia Senator Jack Kingston said it was wrong to spend money on the arts because in his state, quote, we have real people out of work, close quote. The perception that cultural workers from museum guards to orchestra musicians to lighting designers aren't real people is of course totally at odds with the reality that the arts sector adds $504 billion annually to the uh, gross national product of the United States. 
but it's hard to overestimate the broad reach of this pernicious misconception about artists. A 2003 Ford Foundation study looking at attitudes towards artists in the US found, and I'm quoting, 96% of Americans value art in their communities and lives, but only 27% value artists. In fact, of course, culture loves company. It's a deep irony given the perceptual abyss regarding artists that neighborhoods associated with artists as residents and workers are considered among the most vibrant and appealing in the United States. As for organizations, while it may seem counterintuitive if you think about the fierce competition for funding that arts organizations face, in fact, cultural groups thrive in close proximity to one another. The previous image of New York Theater Workshop didn't show the cluster of 16 arts organizations surrounding it on one small block, East 4th Street in Lower Manhattan. The first cultural organization opened on that block in 1974 and is now one of 17 organizations which together attract an audience of a quarter of a million people, employ 1,500 artists, and generate $25 million in economic activity annually for the surrounding restaurants, shops, and support services. And the median budget size of the organizations on East 4th Street is $190,000. This image up here now shows the first effort by New York City government to actively build a cultural district rather than to support a naturally occurring one as in the case of East 4th Street where after about 30 years of many of those organizations squatting in their buildings, the city actually sold them all to the groups for a dollar. It was a very big check. The Downtown Brooklyn Cultural District, as this is called, is now home to over 40 cultural organizations, uh, including the Brooklyn Academy of Music and the Mark Morris Dance Group. Many of these venues are small and are designed to enable experimentation and collaborative work in intimate settings. The most recent phase of construction added three new facilities, all on city-owned property, the last of which opened this past October. The Bam Fisher Theater, a new 250-seat performance and education venue for the Brooklyn Academy of Music. A standalone building for a company called Theater for a New Audience, which had never had a permanent home in its 25 years of earning rave reviews. And uh, the opening production there was by a young director named Julie Tamor, who came back and opened the new theater facility. Um, and a repurposed old vaudeville theater now housing a multi-purpose visual and performing arts organization and an organization called Urban Glass, which is the uh, largest glass blowing facility in the Northeast. And I can tell you, you haven't lived until you've uh, built a uh, multiple set of glass blowing furnaces on the top floors of a 150 year old building over two black box theaters, a television studio and a subway. But this concentration of architectural excellence and creative activity has transformed the way people populate these blocks at the most granular level. It turns out that the staff at the Brooklyn Academy of Music really like the coffee being served at the Performing Arts Center and uh, down the block. And they're heading down uh, a street that was previously barren to go have coffee with the glass blowers. On the way, they're passing droves of people enjoying the sun or the winter wind on the U-shaped benches in a new arts plaza outside Theater for New Audience. The capacity of these organizations to break through decades long and deeply entrenched habits of avoiding certain blocks in a large city and creating a robust new set of desire lines within the neighborhood is the kind of impact that sociologists and urban planners usually just dream about. Myth number three, culture is an afterthought. The problem is that too often culture isn't top of mind for those urban planners and for real estate developers. Instead, the arts are viewed as an afterthought, the cherry on top, rather than a potentially transformative part of community building infrastructure. There's a particularly interesting study by University of Pennsylvania academic Mark Stern, which explores the impact of the arts on quality of life in Philadelphia's neighborhoods. A key finding is that culturally active residents tend to be among the most active participants in all community activities. And because cultural participants see culture where it occurs, they tend to build bridges between geographically and socioeconomically separated communities that otherwise have little interaction among them. This study is particularly exciting from my point of view because it shifts the argument away from whether you like a particular work of art or organization to showing us how an investment in culture in the long run aligns 
with profound civic priorities. Because, of course, the fact is that culture creates community. It's a deep irony, uh, sorry, that culture creates community. Indeed, communities have everything to gain from keeping culture top of mind, weaving it into the fabric of planning, and the benefits of such a strategy don't always require permanent investments so much as a willingness to say yes to artists with big ideas. One way we did this in New York under Mayor Bloomberg's leadership was by hosting nearly 500 temporary public art installations in the course of 12 years. Here are a couple of examples. On the left of this slide is an image of a work called the New York City Waterfalls by an artist named Oliver Eliasson that was put up in 2008. Its economic impact was $69 million. 1.4 million people viewed it from an official vantage point or from a ferry tour boat between June 26th and October 13th of 2008. For almost 25% of visitors, it was the first time they'd ever been to New York's waterfront, which is a really important point given the emphasis the Bloomberg administration placed on trying to reopen uh, the water to our citizens. Also interesting is, and back in 2008, this was sort of the dawn of social media, but the website for this project received more than half a million hits during its duration. And remember, anything put up by the government is automatically suspect and uncool. So uh, it's further impressive that Flickr, remember Flickr? Flickr user post, users posted more than 6,000 photographs of the waterfalls to the site. And in general, so social media hosted numerous different kinds of conversations about the piece from individuals who were never going to be able to visit it, visit it. It was really one of the first times we could track uh, a work of art going viral on social media. Um, the slide all the way to your right is of a piece called Key to the City, uh, which was done in 2010. This was a citywide public art project by the artist Paul Ramirez Jonas. And what he did was invite New Yorkers and visitors to honor a friend, a loved one, or a complete stranger by exchanging keys, in the same way that a dignitary is given a key to the city. But what's special about this key is that each of them unlocked 25 spaces around the five boroughs of New York. Uh, and in a short period of time, over 25,000 keys were distributed. Medico, the lock company, was one of the sponsors. They did a lot of business. Um, what this project did was grant access to the city in all kinds of new ways and help people discover new neighborhoods because locations included a gym locker in Coney Island, a gate at the George Washington Bridge, a light post switch box in uh, Bryant Park in the middle of Manhattan, and a special door behind a curtain in the Brooklyn Museum. And one of the wonderful things about this piece was a number of individuals decided to make it a point to go around and visit all sites. You were given a passport at the same time you were given your key. Um, and uh, we tracked at least three different marriage proposals that came in the course of trekking around after this particular piece. Uh, the final project I just want to highlight, the one that's in the middle, an organization called Sing for Hope put up a project called Pop-Up Pianos. And they've done it in New York three times. The first was in 2010 came back in 2011, and then last year, 2013. And what the project did was place 88 pianos painted by artists in parks and public plazas throughout the five boroughs. Uh, and they were there for two weeks. And uh, during that time, citizens were invited to play from dawn to sunset on these pianos. And when the project was done, in a wonderful act of paying it forward, the pianos were donated to public schools and senior centers who uh, could use them. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that in the three years this project happened, there were only two pianos that were vandalized. Um, one of them was completely destroyed, but um, shamefully so. But otherwise, for New York, that's pretty good. Here's the fourth myth. If you build it, they will come. The opening of Frank Gehry's extraordinary project for the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, had the enormously beneficial impact of focusing attention on the transformative potential of great architecture. But the downside of the so-called Bilbao effect has been a tendency in many places to focus on destination architecture without giving equal attention to nurturing the content to fill it. In fact, several years ago, Glenn Murray, the former mayor of Winnipeg, described the problem of stressing the venue rather than the art as irritable Bilbao syndrome. <laughs> so mayor Murray is one of my personal heroes. 
The fact is that content is key. Long-term value isn't only about venues, as exciting and necessary as they can be. It's dependent on cultivating a community of artists and of audiences devoted to content. To wax Marxist for a moment, it means supporting spaces where art can be made, not just consumed. This is one of the greatest challenges to New York's future as a world capital of culture. The high cost of real estate in many parts of the city is compounded for artists by their need for specific kinds of spaces in which to make work. Any of you who have lived above an oboe player or with a sculptor, and I have done both, can tell you that soundproofing and fire safety take on a whole new meaning. One initiative we took in New York was to create a nonprofit real estate company called Spaceworks, whose sole focus is to develop long-term affordable rehearsal and studio space for artists. In its pilot phase, Spaceworks has opened up a four-studio complex for performing artists and two studios for visual artists. Upcoming projects include studio and rehearsal space in two branches of the Brooklyn Public Library, an indication of potential for co-locating resources for artists, and a strong endorsement of the appeal creative work can have in helping reinvent elements of civic infrastructure to meet future circumstances, specifically the fact that as books go digital, there'll be a lot of available space in libraries that formerly held shelves with books. I feel sacrilegious saying this in this beautiful library, but it's a, a truth that um, big cities are starting to have to plan for. The final myth, being on the side of the angels, is enough. Arts organizations and artists so often uh, revel in the glory of what the, they are doing and don't learn how to communicate it effectively. And let me say that I am a complete and true believer in what artists and organizations do. That said, the kind of dedication and passion it takes to make art or to create and maintain a cultural organization often engenders a kind of single-mindedness that makes it hard to acknowledge that not everyone may appreciate the vision and objectives involved. But the fact is that effort, sincerity, and sometimes even skill aren't necessarily apparent to those who aren't part of the process. And so we're back to where we began, to the essential need to articulate and account for the impact of the arts. The good news is that there are as many ways of doing this as there are cultural projects and organizations. Because each is unique, the value of each can be conveyed uniquely. The key is to think about the audience that needs to be reached. Let me give you two brief examples of programs that have been developed as profound extension of an organization's mission, but which appeal strongly to social service stakeholders for whom arts and culture are not a priority. Some of you may be aware of the Big Apple Circus, but what you may not know is that the organization has developed a clown care program which takes performers out of the ring and puts them on rounds to lift the spirit of pediatric patients in 16 hospitals across the country. As pictured on the left, performers collaborate with doctors and staff to design a program that fits the needs of each hospital and children undergoing treatment for a range of illnesses including cancer and pediatric AIDS. The project doesn't Im improve the health directly of these children, but as a senior administrator at Boston Children's Hospital puts it, the clown care people bring joy, they bring silliness, they bring laughter. They just add this unique other dimension. The image to the right shows Greenhouse, a program of the Horticultural Society of New York, an organization devoted to botanical education for the general public. They have developed a special program that provides workforce training in horticulture to prison inmates in New York. Hands-on experience includes designing, installing, and maintaining the correctional facility gardens on Rikers Island. The program is routinely cited as among the most effective forms of prisoner re-education. And because of its ability to inspire and instill disciplined, productive behavior among participants, it's the only activity in the prison in which inmates are allowed to wield implements. What I've been trying to suggest is some ways of productively understanding the impact of culture, as well as some of the misperceptions that can hinder us from doing so. And while economic impact can provide one approach, thinking about return on investment in other than monetary terms is likely to be far more rewarding. 
The author Anne Lamott recently voiced her concern about quantifying culture in ways that don't acknowledge its uniqueness. The problem, in her words, is that this approach, quote, steals our aliveness. So let me leave you with one final example from the public realm that suggests the complexity and potential of culture's impact. A monumental public art project by the artists Christo and Jean-Claude called The Gates, which we brought to Central Park back in 2005. If you're not familiar with the project, it featured 7,500 16 foot high gates adorned with saffron colored fabric, and don't ever think of it as orange, it was saffron, covering 23 miles of parkland. The work was in place for 16 days in February 2005. Not surprisingly, a lot of people took issue with this. Controversy raged, and questions ranged from polite to obscene versions of what's the point, and why cede city property to a bunch of shower curtains. But the moment the first gate was unfurled, all the abuse directed at the project and its proponents, and all the anxiety about its purpose vanished. People were mesmerized, enthralled, puzzled, critical, moved. Everyone, and I mean everyone, had an opinion. In the spirit of government data gathering, the city undertook an extensive analysis of the event's byproducts and concluded that all told, the gates attracted four million people to Central Park and generated $254 million in economic activity over 16 days, including packed hotels, extra busy cab drivers, and munificently tipped waitresses. Certainly quantifying the impact in economic terms, a way that anyone could appreciate, helped show that art has an enormous impact on our lives, regardless of how you feel about the artwork itself. But appreciation for the gates moved beyond economic development. No amount of numbers captured what was at once a totally personal and totally collective experience. And no one could put a price tag on the value. For the first time since 9-11, New York City was the star of a narrative that had nothing to do with devastation and everything to do with aspiration. Yes, this was a big city project, but I believe its underlying dynamics are relevant to all kinds of communities saying yes to an artist's vision and working diligently and sensitively to make that vision reinforce core values of civil society, like curiosity, imagination, empathy, and tolerance. That's the enormous potential power of art and artists to define and disseminate a community's best vision of itself. And ultimately, that is culture's greatest impact. Thank you. And as promised, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. Sure, you should feel free to yell at me because otherwise we may not all be able to hear you or I'll repeat the question. The, the question is in terms of public art, what would you consider just cause to have a piece removed? Um, first point, the art has to be placed there legally, as in with full permission, et cetera. One of the interesting little stories in New York, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the statue of the bull. There's a sort of you know, charging bull in lower Manhattan. That was actually dropped off in the middle of the night about 15 years ago by the artist, um, who then spent a long time refusing to give the city actual formal permission. Um, you know, to, to sign over intellectual property or anything else to do with the piece. So it was sort of interesting, because it's beloved, it's beautiful, it's all those other kind of good things, but it was a huge legal problem for the city. So thing one has to be put there legally. But I would say, you know, once a piece has been put in place and, you know, therefore endorsed by whoever is sponsoring it, the, the reason to remove it would be public safety. Sometimes, even with the best of intentions, it turns out that a work of art either isn't sturdy enough or is getting used by the public in a way that puts them or the surrounding property in danger. Um, and you know, that's the best possible standard. It's also, I mean, what's interesting in older communities, and I, you know, Nantucket's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I haven't spent enough time here um, to know if this is the case here, but it's also the fact that sometimes uh, tastes change and certain representations can become extremely offensive to people. 
there's, you know, there's another example from New York City, a statue called Civic Virtue, which is you know, of a huge guy basically bludgeoning a, se a series of female figures. Um, and you know, that has become so noxious to community residents that uh, you know, the, an effort has been made to try and find another location for it. Um, you know, so art, public values, they're all living things. Um, and sometimes, you know, something that at one point spoke in a really eloquent way to a society's aspirations can become a real irritant. But that's what I was trying to get at before. I mean, culture is never just happening in a vacuum. It's always expressing uh, a set of potentiality and desires, and that's what makes it so both valuable and often controversial. Sure. Um, I am uh, working as part of a uh, philanthropic consulting firm that Mike Bloomberg set up called Bloomberg Associates, and I'm part of a team of eight people that are uh, offering our services to cities around the world to help on uh, whatever agendas mayors have. Um, the real conviction of my boss is that the uh, given, I think 50% of people already live in cities, and the Stats suggest that by 2030 it'll be 75% of the world's population. So, you know, anything you can do to help cities run better, you are by definition having a huge impact on uh, the quality of life of individuals around the world. Yes. Um, there, there are various generally accepted economic practices for calculating the impact of anything. You know, uh, the real estate industry tends to do this. Uh, often, uh, restaurant collaboratives uh, will get together and calculate their impact. So, uh, there are certain mathematical formulas that are generally accepted uh, ways of doing this. What's interesting with arts and culture, it, and again, it's it's both frustrating and eventually, because I believe we'll all figure this out, fabulous, is that um, the, the economic impact of culture isn't as self-contained as it is for other uh, kinds of commercial endeavors. And here's what I mean. When I worked for the city of New York, one of my amazing colleagues was the film commissioner responsible for permitting film and television shoots in the city. And uh, she deployed various strategies to drastically increase the amount of production in New York. And because of the way film and television shoots calculate what they do, they can tell you to the cup of coffee how much they're spending in New York. And so those numbers were amazing. The thing about nonprofit arts and culture, it's not a hermetically sealed world. So if you go see a show or you go visit a museum and then you go buy a cup of coffee and then you take a taxi somewhere and then you take a walk and maybe purchase something in a store, very hard to follow that chain of economic activity, unlike, again, in a film shoot where you're responsible for your personnel and you know what you're paying them to do or uh, what services you're paying for. Um, another way that this slops over is that while it can be easy for a cultural organization to figure out its direct spend, what is it spending on employees, not all organizations are scrupulous about counting other kinds of economic impact they have. For example, how much are they spending on messenger services? We did a calculation at one point, literally, how much are cultural organizations in the city of New York spending on paper clips purchased from local stores? Um, and, you know, I drove my staff crazy, but we could do it. Uh, so the, the point being, yes, there are accepted methods of tracking this, but also localities can come up with their own forms of calculation that may speak in more meaningful ways uh, to their own interests. I've often wanted to do a study of um, the impact on parking lots of cultural activity. Because anecdotally, you know, every time a performing arts center or a museum is open, parking activity spikes. When they're closed, um, you know, that changes. And you can track you know, the differential if you really wanted to. It would take a lot of legwork going around to talk to a lot of parking attendants and asking them to give you their receipts. Um, but that's why the, the dry cleaning industry Thing that my colleagues in LA came up with, I thought was so brilliant because you know that's a theater town, and um, to be able to look at that 
gives you a sense in your head of a very concrete kind of impact that I think, again, people just sort of wash over. They don't look at this as real work done by real people. Yes, sir. One of my biggest frustrations, because as I'm sure you've all gathered, I'm basically a dyed-in-the-wool nerd, is I actually, I had queued up, a, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice was willing to partner on a study looking at exactly this, specifically the impact of cultural organizations on crime. Because, you know, I would, when I would go visit organizations, often I would get to meet the captain of a local police precinct, and inevitably they would say how much they appreciated cultural institutions, because as, you know, to your point, just by being open, even if, you know, Performing Arts Center isn't performing, um, it tends to cut down on bad behavior in the immediate location. The problem in terms of designing a study is that it was almost impossible to get before and after statistics. Because unless you know you're a brand new organization, uh, there aren't enough data sets to show what the criminal activity was like beforehand. Um, so you know I think this is a huge opportunity in newer communities that are more newly developing um, institutions. But we couldn't come up with an example in New York that I thought was you know worth the statistical heartache of of trying to run those numbers. Yes, sir, in the back. Sure, I mean, it, it's, it's a really interesting question, um, partly because I, uh, I started my job two years after uh, the previous mayoral administration had actually tried to evict the Brooklyn Museum from its city-owned building. Um, because of controversy over a show called Sensation um, that contained an artwork that a lot of people found uh, offensive. Um, and I guess one thing I did um, was frankly very pragmatic, which is to be constantly mindful of shows that were gonna be controversial. Um, my boss happens to believe fiercely in freedom of speech, and it's a little known fact that Mike Bloomberg was the first person waiting outside the Brooklyn Museum when the Sensation Show opened, because he felt it was really important to support um, that, that kind of expression. Um, that said, you know, there's no reason to stick your head in the oven if you don't absolutely have to. So um, there were a number of shows uh, during my tenure that were very controversial. Um, the first one, for example, was a show called Mirroring Evil. I don't know if any of you remember it, but the Jewish Museum put on a show with the, the premise of looking at why it is that uh, art relating to Nazis and Nazi Germany so often glorified uh, the subject matter. And it was a really serious effort to try and look at this, but it, uh, there, were, there were a couple of pieces in it. One was an image of and a concentration camp inmate and airbrushed into his hand was a can of Coke. Um, and taken out of context, it was an absolutely inflammatory kind of image. So in any case, I knew about the show. I knew that it was gonna be controversial. I made sure to go when they were hanging it so I could look at it myself. I could talk to the curators. I could look at the wall text. I could understand how anybody actually going to it would receive the show. And you know, that was a case where it was absolutely responsible. Um, you know, the upfront, the introduction, the, the way people were pulsed through it um, was super scrupulous. There were a couple of other examples during my time where I thought museums were not being quite so responsible. Um, and I've always, often thought it would be interesting to teach a course called Curating Controversy, because if you're going to do something that really pushes the envelope, you have to do it out of respect for your audience. If you're just trying to piss people off, it seems to me, particularly if you're trying to piss people off with public money, that's just a silly idea. Um, but the bottom line is there, there, were, there was never a case where I felt it was genuinely not in the city's interests or the interests of the organization or the interests of the artists to not show the work. There just were ways of uh, making it uh, 
appropriate for the public. I mean, an, an interesting example, one of our temporary art um, exhibitions was by the British artist Anthony Gormley. It's called Event Horizon, and it featured 31 um, life-size uh, statues placed on the rooftop of buildings around um, the Flatiron District in New York. And it was a very cool, it was sort of a Where's Waldo kind of project, and people got really into it. But in that case, because of the nature of the figures, we had the police department do a press conference two weeks beforehand saying that this was coming, and you know, saying that these weren't people committing suicide, it was an art project. Um, and you know, because no deed goes, good deeds goes unpunished, there was a lot of press coverage about how scandalous it was that we were doing this project. Um, and there were a series of false alarms, and you know, one of the tabloid newspapers kept running headlines like suicide jumpers at the Empire State Building and stuff like that. But you know, the mayor was very cool about it, and he just said, this is a great show, you should go see it. We've all been told what it is and what it isn't, um, so calm down, and it was great. So one way was just by trying to be very proactive in understanding what might be controversial. Um, and you know, beyond that, I think, uh, Again, because the city of New York was, relatively speaking, a very generous funder, I mean, it's never enough uh, for arts organizations, um, and because we tried to be as clear as possible about, that, about the criteria for funding, um, and you know, the fundamental criteria was public service. You know, I don't like Shostakovich that much, I will admit that, but if you want to play it, that's great, particularly if you're doing it for free and you're doing it well. So uh, you know, we made sure to steer clear of content and be very straightforward with organizations. And I think, you know, by and large, um, that was a very helpful way of making clear that we were taking seriously the role of these organizations um, as parts of our civic fabric. Um, there are two people. So I guess one in the back, and then if we have time. Um, I don't know. The question was, is there a transcript of my remarks? Um, right. We, to be negotiated. <laughs> and the, so the second question is about uh, studies of arts education in the public school system. Um, is actually something that we worked uh, quite hard on. When, when we started, one of the things that Mayor Blumberg asked me to do was work with the Department of Education on the status of arts ed. And what we found was that there was no longer a curriculum in the four state mandated areas in New York State. It's uh, theater, music, visual arts, and dance. Um, so I figured we'd go take what Chicago had and just do search and replace and you know, stick New York in where Chicago used to be. But it turned out there was no longer a um, K through 12 arts curriculum in any urban public school district in the country. So we worked on developing our own. Um, and New York has since also developed a digital curriculum, which is pretty interesting and tends to get attached to uh, visual arts. Um, we also started a um, program whereby public schools have to report out on what arts ed they're providing. Um, so, you know, I think we, we did a good job of reintroducing the basics and creating an accountability system that no place else in New York State currently has. Uh, that said, it's an it's a enormously complicated field for a number of reasons. One is that anytime you have a state-mandated curriculum in a system where for various reasons, including unionized labor, there isn't absolute control over what gets taught in a school. Um, that can be complicated, but the other thing is that education is changing so much. It used to be, and, and the way the state standards work, there's one standard for elementary, another for middle school, and another for high school. And in fact, the way schools are being reorganized, most often now you have schools that run K through six or seven, and then eight through 12. So having a different standard in middle school pulls against what school administrators are trying to do. So you know, I'm hopeful that that will continue to be a real focus um, for the New York City public school system, but also for school systems around the country. Chicago is doing some really interesting things. Dallas is doing some interesting things. So um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that more focus will return to that. I think there's time for one more question. 
It's a great question. I mean, I think that there are a number of cultural disciplines that, you know, as recently as 10 years ago wouldn't have been considered culture. One of my favorites is the culinary arts. Um, but they're all forms of design, including industrial design, um, you know, that I think are increasingly accepted as a cultural discipline. Fashion is another one. So, you know, I think film is a technology that, like many, can be used to create cultural products, can be used to create other kinds of products. One of the things that most interests me about film is the extent to which it's become part of a do-it-yourself cultural movement. And I think one of the you know, opportunities that the cultural community really needs to seize is to look differently at how we calculate forms of arts participation. The big national studies tend to just count um, ticket sales. And you know, if ticket sales to the opera or the ballet are falling, you know, that places in question the importance and the vibrancy of the sector. At the same time, for example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art gets 40 million hits a year for its art history timeline. And I would argue that's a form of cultural participation. The number of people who make videos and post them to YouTube, I mean, I'm not so interested in the dancing cats, I confess to you, but you know, there, there's a lot of that material that's a really serious endeavor to interrogate certain kinds of visual ideas. It's striking to me that the single biggest form of cultural participation in the United States for the past 50 years since the Wallace Foundation's been studying it is choral singing. Um, and yet, some people get kind of snotty saying, if that's amateur, it doesn't count. So I think there are a lot of really interesting and difficult questions around the relationship of amateur to professional art making. Um, and I think film as a technology is right in the center of a lot of them. I'm sure you all will have lots of time for conversation. We have drinks and appetizers in the back, and I invite you to stay. And Kate, thank you so much. We've really enjoyed this very much.